Hi, everyone. Welcome to another lecture of Skepticism 101 for my Chapman University course. This one on what is science and what is skepticism anyway? This is actually uh, the first lecture I give, but because I had actually given this lecture in person, I'm now just remotely recording it for the historical record. So let me turn on the PowerPoint here and we'll be off and running. This lecture is based on my first book, why People Believe Weird Things. They're in the left corner, the original cover. In the right, the latest incarnation. Publishers have a tendency to do that. In fact, here is the original cover, which I'm pretty proud of because that was a painting commissioned by the publisher uh, at the time, W.H. Freeman. Now it's published by Henry Holt. These companies buy each other out. Anyway, here is the original painting, which I just snapped from my wall, uh, which I purchased from the artist because I thought it was such a cool image. Uh, cool imagery of that just sort of weird feeling over urban America or, or whatever it's trying to capture, just, you know, kind of the that kind of X-Files green there. Anyway, I, th I thought that was kind of cool. So, um, and of course, much of this lecture is also based on Skeptic Magazine, since that's what um, I do for my day job is publish this magazine. Every issue has a particular theme to it, as I usually introduce this point in the lecture like the future of intelligence. Are we getting smarter or dumber? In fact, uh, by personal experience, it seems like we're getting dumber, but anecdotally speaking. But in fact, um, uh, IQ scores are going up about three points every 10 years, so-called Flynn effects, so we talked about that. Artificial intelligence, we keep returning to this theme. Uh, when will humans, when will computers achieve human level intelligence? And as we concluded then, we're five years away and always will be. Uh, was Scientology a cult? You decide. Was 9-11 an inside job? Well, was it a conspiracy? Yes, conspiracy of Al-Qaeda, uh, but not a conspiracy of the Bush administration. But what are conspiracies and so forth? Climate change? Are you a global warming skeptic? Or are you skeptical of the global warming skeptics? Which kind of tells us that skepticism doesn't just mean one position always, always denying uh, claims. We believe all sorts of things depending on the evidence. Um, so that leads me to, oh, I, I should introduce here, Junior Skeptic. I forgot. Dan Loxton, our wonderful editor and writer for Junior Skeptic. Uh, we're really trying to teach science and skepticism, critical thinking, ra reason and rationality to the next generation, the future generation, all generations, really, because so many of the um, kids that read Junior Skeptic, their parents read it too, which is kind of cool. So, and you can join the Skeptic Society and subscribe to Skeptic Magazine at skeptic.com. Here's a, a recent issue uh, with Steve Pinker on the cover, uh, uh, arguing why we are not living in a post-truth era, which in itself kind of introduces the idea of what is science and skepticism. You know, if you argue that um, we're living in a post-truth world, what are you arguing with? Because there's some standard by which you're deciding that your argument is true, so you're using the concept of truth and reason, using reason as a tool to get to the truth of what you think is the truth, that we're living in a post-truth world, so we can't be living in a post-truth world, and so on. Anyway, um, that's just sort of a, a, a brief introduction to that. And when you subscribe to Skeptic Magazine, you get to meet our dog. Here he is. The skeptical dog is very skeptical. <laughs> um, anyway, let's let's dig into it. So what is skepticism or what is a skeptic? Well, we can turn to the Oxford English Dictionary, which is our best source for the history of the use of a word. Again, dictionaries don't give definitions of words. They give really usages. That is how people have defined the word uh, historically, and those, those definitions change. In any case, here's the first definition of skeptic. One who, like Pyro and his followers in Greek antiquity, doubts the possibility of real knowledge of any kind one who holds that there are no adequate grounds for certainty as to the truth of any proposition. Well, as you can see, that can't be true because if it were, then itself couldn't be true. This is like um, the way Pinker or, 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 um, began his article for us. That is, is the claim we're living in a post-truth world true? If it is, then it isn't. Okay, you get the idea. So you can't doubt any knowledge uh, and all knowledge because even that process itself is self-refuting. So if we dig a little deeper to some of the other definitions, skeptic is from the Greek skeptikos or thoughtful. 
Entomologically, in fact, its Latin derivatives is skepticus for inquiring or reflective. Further variations in the ancient Greek include watchman and mark to aim at, and a seeker after truth, an inquirer who has not yet arrived at def definite convictions. Okay, now we're getting closer, I think, to a more pragmatic, useful, applicable idea of what is, it means to be a skeptic. That is, we're curious, we're inquiring, we reflect on the claims and the evidence. We set a mark to aim at, that is, the scientific method, certain standards of evidence that must be met before we accept a claim is true, provisionally true with a small t. We're seeking truth with a small t, but we're never going to get there because there's no capital T truths in science. None of us are omniscient. We're not deities. We will never know with 100% certainty about something. Um, and so in that sense, virtue, uh, skepticism is a virtue. It's thoughtful and reflective inquiry. Skeptics are the watchmen of good science and good ideas. And we have our own magazine. <laughs> okay. Um, so that's kind of how we define it at Skeptic. Uh, we actually made a video. Brian Dalton, our the filmmaker and, and videographer, uh, created a uh, short couple minute video here uh, in which we talk about all right, talk about this. So I'll play this now, capturing what it means to be a skeptic. What is a skeptic? What is a skeptic? That's a mighty fine question right there. What is a skeptic? Skepticism has a long historical tradition dating back to the ancient Greeks. Like when the philosopher Socrates observed, All I know is that I know nothing. What happened to the Parthenon? Of course, that kind of know-nothing skepticism is just silly. If you were skeptical about everything, you'd have to be skeptical about your own skepticism. Is it just me, or has he not really said anything yet? Modern skepticism is embodied in the scientific method. It's about gathering data and testing claims made about natural phenomena. That's phenomenal! But a claim becomes a fact only when it is confirmed by investigation and observation to such an extent that reason demands our temporary agreement. Okay, so now we're getting somewhere. We test, observe, and confirm claims, then they become facts, and we're done. That's easy, I can do that. Well, not so fast. All facts in science are provisional. That means they're subject to challenge, and ultimately, even to change. Oh boy, here we go. That means skepticism is a method leading to provisional conclusions. Oh, I am getting such a headache. But some claims, such as water dowsing, ESP, and creationism, have been tested and failed those tests so completely, so many times, that we can provisionally conclude they're not true. Sounds to me like you're just a big fat claim denier. No, we do need to test and investigate claims, but proper skepticism begins with a mind open to the possibility that the claim could be true. We just need to see the compelling evidence that the claim is true before we believe it. Okay, that actually sounds fairly reasonable. And when claims have been tested and the results are inconclusive, we withhold judgment and continue to formulate hypotheses and theories until we gather the evidence needed to reach a provisional conclusion. Okay. I see what you're trying to do here. You're trying to sound all reasonable so that people don't think you're a regular old cynic. Well, let me tell you something, Mr. Shermer. I am onto you, and that is so cynical. We really aren't just a bunch of grumpy old curmudgeons who are unwilling to accept any new claim that challenges the status quo. Curmudgeon, hold on there, fella. I need to hop into my horse and buggy and head out to my temperance meeting. But does Grover Cleveland know you've stolen his vocabulary? Skepticism is simply a provisional approach to claims. It's the application of the methods of science and of reason to any and all ideas. No sacred cows allowed. Oh boy, my Hindu friends are not going to like that. The key to skepticism is to continually and vigorously apply the methods of science in order to navigate between know-nothing skepticism and believe-everything credulity. Credulity... Credulity. That just means being too eager to believe everything anyone says. Eager. Eager. E-A-G-E-R, is that? Eager just means wanting to do or have something very much. I don't believe you, nor am I eager to do so. Ultimately, a good skeptic tries to follow the efforts of the philosopher Baruch Spinoza, who wrote, I have made a ceaseless effort not to ridicule, not to bewail, not to scorn human actions, but to understand them. Wait, 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 wait. I love to ridicule, bewail, and scorn human actions. Then you might be a satirist. 
Satirist. Satirist. And by the way, Spinoza, he was Dutch. Yeah, I know, but I can't do a Dutch accent. Trust me, you can't do a British accent either. Hurtful. <laughs> that was the incomparable Brian Dalton. Uh, and if you recall from the conspiracy lecture, he produced the uh, You Can't Handle the Truth video for us, in which we sort of spoof the 9-11 truther claims. In any case, what is it that people believe that we find weird? When I talk about weird things, what are weird things? Of course, there's no solid definition of it, but by way of example, uh, I use here a 2009 Harris poll of 2,303 adult Americans who were asked to please indicate for each one if you believe in it or not. So 82% said they believe in God, 76% in miracles, 75% in heaven, 72% angels, 71% in life after death, 61% in hell. Notice, by the way, the difference between heaven, 71%, and hell, 61%. There's the over-optimism bias uh, Jesus' virgin birth, 61%, the devil, 60%, the theory of evolution, 45%, way below even the devil. Wow. Uh, ghosts, 42%, creationism, 40%, UFOs, 32%, and by that they mean that UFOs represent extraterrestrial vehicles, not just weird things in the sky. 26% believe in astrology and 20% in a reincarnation, one out of five. So... The claims that we deal with in skepticism are not trivial in as much as significant percentages of the population believe in them. And when somebody believes in something, even if it's not true, they act, they may act on those beliefs. And so for them, the phenomenon is real. It does exist, at least in their heads. So, uh, and as Carl Sagan liked to say um, in one of my favorite passages from his great work, The Demon Haunted World, which came out the year before, my why people believe weird things. This is still one of the classics in modern skepticism, 1996, The Demon Haunted World. Carl writes, I worry that pseudoscience and superstition will seem year by year more tempting, the siren song of unreason, more sonorous and attractive. Where have we heard it before? Whenever our ethnic or national prejudices are aroused, in times of scarcity, during challenges to national self-esteem or nerve, when we agonize about our diminished cosmic place and purpose, or when fanaticism is bubbling up around us, then habits of thought familiar from ages past reach for the controls. The candle flame gutters. Its little pool of light trembles. Darkness gathers. The demons begin to stir. Man, that is great writing. Carl, one of the great minds of our time, and by the way, I dedicated why people believe weird things to Carl. So pseudoscience, what do we mean when we talk about pseudoscience? How are we defining it? It's necessarily defined by its relation to science and typically involves subjects that are either on the margins or borderlands of science and are not yet proven or have been disproven or make claims that sound scientific but in fact have no relationship to science. That is to say, a, a pseudoscientific claim we think of as something that sounds kind of sciency. They string together a bunch of words that sound kind of technical, um, like quantum consciousness. You know, consciousness is spooky and weird. Quantum physics is spooky and weird. So they must be related. Quantum consciousness. Okay, these are just words people are using. That doesn't make it science. Uh, here are some of the pseudonyms for science. Bad science. Junk science, voodoo science, crackpot science, pathological science, non-science, and plain old nonsense. The problem is, uh, my friend and colleague Michael Gordon uh, describes in his great work, The Pseudoscience Wars. Now, he's using as a, a type specimen Emmanuel Velikovsky and his uh, whole uh, kind of fringe theory about worlds in collision, about where the planets really came from. Um, that no one in the history of the world has ever self-identified as a pseudoscientist. There is no person who wakes up in the morning and thinks to himself, I'll just head into my pseudo-laboratory and perform some pseudo-experiments to try to confirm my pseudo-theories with pseudo-facts. <laughs> in the same way that I say no one in the history of the world has ever joined a cult, right? People join groups that they think are are, are worthy and, and good and going to help the world or help themselves. Um, and the same thing here. No one thinks they're a pseudoscientist, right? So it's really only from uh, some historical distance or reflective from outside the, the particular claim that you can kind of put some parameters around it. 
By the way, this is in the philosophy of science known as the demarcation problem. That is, how do we demarcate between science and pseudoscience, which really this whole lecture is about. Really, the whole course is about that. Uh, in trying to get to the truth, we have to decide which are the right avenues and which are the wrong avenues to get to it. And in reflection, we think, well, the pseudoscience people went down the wrong path. But again, they don't think they did that. That's why I also like to quote Carl um, in his um, observation that you can get into a habit of thought in which you enjoy making fun of all those other people who don't see things as clearly as you do. We have to guard carefully against it. I think that's right. I myself often fall into um, a pattern of, of just sort of making fun of people or, or, or belittling, you know, fringe claims. And the fringier they are, the easier it is to do. And we have to be careful not to do that. Uh, I also like to quote Ludwig von Mises in his great work, The Anti-Capitalist Mentality, 1956. He said, an anti-something movement displays a purely negative attitude. It has no chance whatever to succeed. Its passionate diatribes virtually advertise the program they attack. People must fight for something that they want to achieve, not simply reject an evil, however bad it may be. Now, von Mises, one of the great um, economists of the 20th century, he was part of the so-called Austrian School of Economics. Um, he was writing uh, about the anti-communist movement of the 1940s and 50s um, on the part of pro-capitalist, free market, free enterprise economists and promoters. And he's warning them that it, we can't just attack communism. We have to say, well, what's good about capitalism? What, what is it we believe about economics, not just what we don't believe? I make the same argument about uh, atheism. Atheism isn't a thing. Uh, there's no set of doctrines of wh what we believe as atheists. We just don't believe in God full stop. That's it. But that's not enough. We can't just say, define ourselves by what we don't believe. We have to say what we do believe. We believe in science and reason and rationality and empiricism and experiment and testing. We believe in civil rights and civil liberties and women's rights and gay rights, animal rights, children's rights, workers' rights, the future of humanity's rights, future generations' rights. And, um, you know, there's a whole suite of things that are on the positive side that we do believe that as skeptics, humanists, scientists, whatever, scientific humanists as I call it, uh, that we assert what we do believe. The attacking by itself, skepticism by itself is not enough. It's a necessary tool, but it's not enough. We have to go more. That's why when we started the skeptics in 1992, we adopted as our motto a quote from Baroque Spinoza, I have made a ceaseless effort not to ridicule, not to bewail, not to scorn human actions, but to understand them. And, um, and, and it's that key, that last phrase there, understanding them. That's what science is all about. Science and skepticism is trying to understand the cause of things in the world. And when we do that, when uh, we, we, we have to specify, we're looking for natural explanations for natural phenomenon. And we always have to ask ourselves, what's more likely? In this case, with this crop circle, what's more likely? That aliens traverse the vast instances of interstellar space and landed in Farmer Bob's Field in Puckerbrush, Kansas to make a crop circle that says skeptic.com to promote our webpage? Or that somebody with Photoshop just created this for me. <laughs> and of course, the latter one is, 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 a, is a better explanation, a what's more likely explanation. Now, in another lecture, I'll, uh, I talk about David Hume and uh, the idea of, uh, of proportionality, that is proportioning your uh, confidence in a belief to the evidence, uh, a confidence in a claim to the evidence for it before you believe it. And uh, so in a way, that's what I'm arguing here. It's, it's Hume's what's more likely question. We can do the same thing with this World Weekly News headline, Alien Backs Arnold for Governor. This is, of course, the governor of my state for, for years, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, that is, before we say something is out of this world, let's first make sure that it's not in this world. That is, again, what's more likely that aliens traverse the vast instances of interstellar space and landed in Sacramento, California to help the governor, or that the World Weekly News just makes stuff up. Well, we have no evidence of aliens landing anywhere, anywhere on Earth. We have lots of evidence of tabloid newspapers and magazines just making stuff up. That's what they do. We know this because 
plenty of people that work there have come out and said, oh, yeah, we sit around the conference table, just make shit up all morning and then print it that afternoon. OK, they just lie. OK, and we have lots of evidence of humans exaggerating, lying, distorting, deceiving, self-deceiving and so on. No evidence of aliens landing. Ergo, fake. So let's get to it. Um, so this is the whole couple first couple chapters of why people believe weird things, which I define science as a set of methods designed to describe and interpret observed or inferred phenomenon, past or present, aimed at building a testable body of knowledge open to rejection or confirmation. Okay, so let's 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 deconstruct it. So uh, it's a set of methods. It's just it's it's not a thing like a noun. It's more like a verb. It's a, it's a set of things that you do. D to do what? D they're designed to describe and interpret. So we're describing, we're looking, we're describing what we're looking at. But the facts never just speak for themselves. You have to interpret them through some belief system, some model, some paradigm, some hypothesis, theory, whatever, worldview. Um, and observed or inferred. So sometimes we can actually directly see something. Or sometimes we infer its existence from the traces left behind, right? So we can't observe. No one's observed the Big Bang, of course. It's a one-off historical event. But we infer that it happened from multiple lines of inquiry. All historical sciences are inferential sciences. And much of the physical sciences, in fact, um, you're inferring causality from relationships that you can't directly observe. OK, so we have both observed and inferred phenomena. Past or present, I throw that in there just because I don't want science to be restricted to just the stuff you can test in the laboratory that's happening right now. But so much of what we're trying to understand about the world already happened. So there has to be a way to get at that uh, without it just being opinion that, in fact, it's it's a it's a scientific matter aimed at building a testable body of knowledge. OK, the key word here is testable. Right. You have to be able to test it. If you can't test it. This idea of falsifiability, if you can't falsify it, then you're not doing science. There has to be a way that for it to get out of my head and your head alone that, you know, you can test it. I can test it. They can test it. Different people can look at it later, now, whenever, and they can run the experiment. They can look at the same data set. They can dig up in the ground the same, same area where we dug for the archaeological uh, artifacts and so on. Right. Um, and so the key here is open to rejection or confirmation. So, of course, not confirmation as in proven, but con confirmation that it hasn't been falsified. Now, if you reject it, then that's a point against it. If you confirm it, it's it's kind of a point for it, although, again, not proving, but it hasn't been rejected. So our confidence can go up a little bit. OK, that mumbo jumbo long definition can be summarized more shortly. A method to explain the world that is testable and open to change. Always open to change in your mind about something when new evidence comes in. That's the key to science. Now, philosophers of science talk about something related to this. They call the hypothetical deductive method. That is, one, you put forward a hypothesis. Two, conjoin that hypothesis with a statement of initial conditions that here are the factors that led to that hypothesis. Then you deduce from that a prediction. OK, if, if this is true, then this should follow. And then you check to see if it does follow. That is, you run an experiment, you make an observation, you, you know, dig another area in the in the dirt where the archaeological find is, or you look in the telescopes to see uh, a similar uh, stellar systems or galactic systems or whatever. You see what I'm going with that now. So again, th these kind of enumerated scientific method lists, charts, graphs, images things you see online. They don't exist in the real world. There's no lab you're going to go into where they're going to have a one, two, three, four, here's what we're doing. But, you know, cognitively speaking, this is something along the lines of what science is doing. Now, if you don't have that, then really all of us just start with things we already believe from our upbringing, our parents, our teachers, books we read, whatever. Uh, groups we hang out with, peer, peer groups and so on. And then we collect evidence to support it. So our brains are more like lawyers than scientists, you know, just trying to defend and win the case for our hypothesis. The point of science is that um, you might be wrong, and, and, and we know you, we're all subject to confirmation bias and hindsight bias and so forth, so that you have to have some way to get at it to test it. And that's the key here is to see whether that step four, whether that prediction is fulfilled or not by testing. Okay. 
Another way to say it, again, not, not enumerated exactly, but observation, we gather data through the senses or sensory enhancing technologies like microscopes and telescopes and so on. Uh, induction, from that we draw general conclusions from that data. That is, we form hypotheses. Then deduction, we make specific predictions from the general conclusions or hypotheses. If this is true, then this should follow. And then, of course, step four, verification. You check the predictions against further observations. Okay, again, no one's enumerating this in any lab. This is just a kind of way of thinking about the world. Feynman put this, uh, or actually uh, uh, C Sir Peter Medawar put this <laughs> rather poignantly. Ask a scientist what he conceives the scientific method to be, and he will adopt an expression that is at once solemn and shifty-eyed. Solemn because he feels he ought to declare an opinion. Shifty-eyed because he's wondering how to conceal the fact that he has no opinion to declare. <laughs> that is, scientists, they just inculcate a, a certain way of thinking about the world that follows along those lines of forming hypotheses, making predictions, and testing their hypotheses and predictions against the real world. But if you ask them what exactly you do, they're not going to enumerate a list like that. It's, it's more of a, a, a kind of a, a way that they think that maybe they can't articulate. That's what Peter Medawar is after here. Uh, Sir Arthur Stanley Eddington put it this way, for the truth of the conclusions of science, observation is the supreme court of appeal. I just love that line. This is from his great uh, work on the nature of physical uh, sciences, or I think it was the nature of physical law, uh, in which um, he was the guy who tested Einstein's hypothesis that, um, that the sun is a massive gravitational object will distort the light behind it. That is to say, he predicted that light coming near, let's say this is the sun, coming near it is going to be bent in a certain way. Not because uh, gravity is pulling it toward it, but because the sun is creating a distortion of the space-time around it. So the light, the photons whipping past it are being bent, much like the bowling ball in a big sheet of rubber. You know, if you roll a little marble next to it, it's going to... Whoosh, swing like that because it's distorted. Okay. Anyway, I don't want to get into all that, but, but uh, Ed Eddington uh, was trying to figure out a way to test this hypothesis. And so if you look at this actual chart here, you'll see the actual position of the star. Now th they knew where the star was because at, at a different time of the year when, when the night sky is out and uh, when the earth is on the other side of the planet and the sun's not blocking those stars, you could accurately mark where it is and then six months later your the sun uh, the earth is over here and now the sun is is uh is uh, blotting out the, the stars but during a solar eclipse the sun is blocked and you can see the stars behind it and he was then able to calculate the apparent position of the star and that little difference there the bending of the light that was near the sun uh, was pretty close to, well, very, very close to exactly what Einstein predicted. This happened in 1919, and this is what put Einstein on the map. This is what made him famous. So it's not enough just to have brilliant theories, beautiful equations, and so on. You actually have to be right. <laughs> and by right, I mean you've tested your ideas at the Supreme Court of Appeal, which is observation. Okay. Feynman put it this way. If it disagrees with experiment, it is wrong. In that simple statement is the key to science. It doesn't make any difference how beautiful your guess is, how smart you are, who made the guess, or what his name is. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. And that's all there is to it. And here's that actual quote, which you can find online. This is from a lecture by Feynman, and I think it was 1964. Now I'm going to discuss how we would look for a new law. In general, we look for a new law by the following process. First, we guess it. <laughs> then we com well, don't laugh. That's what really true. Then we compute the consequences of the guess to see what, if this is right, if this law that we guess is right, we see what it would imply. And then we compare those computation results to nature. Or we say compare to experiment or experience compare it directly with observation to see if it, if it works. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. And that simple statement is the key to science. 
It doesn't make any difference how beautiful your guest is. It doesn't make any difference how smart you are who made the guest or what his name is. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. That's all there is to it. <laughs> it's wrong. <laughs> you gotta love that. That's right. It's beautifully put. And so here's a, a, a perfect example of this, of the um, uh, of putting a claim to the test. So this is this was a phenomenon in the uh, late 1990s and early 2000s called therapeutic touch. So the theory is that it's based on this Eastern idea that the human body has an energy field. Uh, you know, we have these chakras like the crown chakra and the throat chakra and the heart chakra and the solar plexus chakra and so forth. The energy flows through the body like this and then it can get blocked at these chakra points and therefore you have to you know, do massage or meditate or, or, or acupuncture, whatever. Uh, and so this new technique was that you massage the human energy field without actually touching the person's body. That is, you're, you're touching the energy that extends beyond the human body. That's the idea behind it. It looks something like this. Here's a, uh, a practitioner of therapeutic touch uh, massaging the human energy field of the patient or client. Uh, she's not actually touching again. It's just a couple inches above the body. You'll see them massaging it and, and going, oh, it's it's dark energy or it's bright energy. And they describe it like they can see it and so on. We call that the touchy feely without the touchy. Anyway, my friend Linda Rosa, who's a nurse practitioner in Boulder, Colorado, uh, was watching a video of this one day when her young daughter, little Emily, uh, while in fourth grade, was trying to think of what she was going to do for her fourth grade science project. And so she hatched this idea, watching this video with her mom of these therapeutic touch practitioners, she would put them to the test. That is to say, can they actually detect the human energy field? Now, for a fourth grade science project, she doesn't have time to test whether they can actually heal people. That's a much more complicated issue because you have to control for all the intervening variables as well as the placebo effect and so forth. All she could do was just, well, can they actually detect the human energy field or not? And uh, so she did this with a very simple setup. She had a card table, a piece of cardboard that was opaque. The practitioner would put their hands through two little slots, and she would simply hold her hand above the left hand or the right hand and ask the practitioner, which hand do I have it above, and then record it in her little notebook here. So you have essentially, here's an example of what it looks like, R and L for right and left from the practitioner's point of view. And Emily wouldn't just hold her hand above or the left or right, and then record it with a pencil in her. So you have, uh, you don't need a billion dollar particle accelerator. You just need a card table, a piece of cardboard, and uh, a paper and pencil and a dice to decide as the random number generator whether she would throw her uh, hand above, uh, put her hand above the right hand or left hand, not a dice, a simple coin flip. So she tested 21 uh, therapeutic touch practitioners. Uh, they had ranged in experience from one year to 21 years of doing this. She actually used a, a ruler to measure exactly how far above the hand uh, she would put her hand just so they couldn't detect any like air, you know, like she was moving above it, right? And in other words, controlling for the intervening variables as best she could. Results, 280 trials. They got 123 hits and 157 misses. They did worse than random guessing. That is to say, you would expect by a coin flip model, a 50-50 hit rate. Now, 44% wasn't statistically significant below chance. <laughs> there was no skeptic effect suppressing the energies or anything like that. No, in fact, Emily just figured out that they couldn't do it. They could not do it above chance. So whatever it is they think they're doing in their minds, when they can't actually see the person on the other side, they don't detect the human energy field. So anyway, we published that in Skeptic uh, to no great fanfare because our readers were pretty skeptical of this in the first place. But Emily and her mom and her stepdad at the time, uh, they actually gathered more data, tested more uh, practitioners and wrote it up in a professional uh, journal article and submitted it to the journal of the American Medical Association where it was accepted for publication, unbelievably. Uh, and uh, Emily became something of, of a little bit of, of a celebrity. She did all the talk shows and uh, camera crews came out to her home to film her doing this. And she was a national star for a while because of the so-called Emily experiment. And here is uh, a video that John Stossel did when he was with ABC uh, and, uh, showing how she did this. I think it was ABC 2020 covered this. Watching voodoo, here Priestess Jones says she's pulling out someone's negative energy and shaking it away. 
I'm struck by how similar it is to what's being done right now in mainstream American hospitals. It's called therapeutic touch, and it's practiced in hundreds of medical centers, even during surgery. In Connecticut, nurse Ann Miner does therapeutic touch on Lisa Brackett to help treat her leukemia. Tremendous heat coming from your heart center. Do you feel it? Yeah, I do. The nurse supposedly feels without touching from three or four inches away, feels the defective energy pouring out. I can feel where the energy is balanced and where it's not balanced. I can feel where it's intense. I can feel it's depleted. Then she says she channels the healing energy of the universe through her hands to you. There's no scientific proof that this works, but the patient says that doesn't matter. I don't need explanations because I have faith in the process. That's a really wonderful thing when you feel helpless, terrified, when you're given a diagnosis like I was. It's hard to argue with satisfied patients. But two years ago, a nine-year-old girl in Colorado thought Hello. that for her fourth grade science Today, project, she'd put therapeutic touch to the test. Today I'm going to test you on how well you can feel the human energy field. Emily Rose's test was simple. She asked practitioners of therapeutic touch to feel the energy from her hand. But first, she had them put their hand through a towel and piece of cardboard so they couldn't see where her hand was. She didn't ask them to heal anything. She just asked the most okay. basic question. Tell me which of your hands you think my hand is over. Left. Again and again, touch therapists failed the test. Left. Amazingly, they kept volunteering to take the test. And even when they right. failed to do better at picking the correct hand than they would have done flipping a coin. Right. Their faith in their skills was not dimmed. Okay. This woman guessed right only three times out of ten. How do you think the test went? I think it went very well. Okay, you got one right. <laughs> Sorry. So, were they embarrassed? No, not really. Um, some thought if you got four out of ten right, they thought you'd pass. And obviously they didn't know their statistics. We asked more than a dozen therapeutic touch specialists to come here and take your test, and not one would. Does that surprise you? Mm -mm. No. Why is it? Lots of people think that I scared them really good. Well, not that good. Though Emily's test got publicity, it was published in the prestigious Journal of the American Medical Association. Since then, therapeutic touch is practiced more than ever. Okay. So, yeah, it's just such a remarkable, powerful example. Uh, that is to say, as Patrick Daniel Patrick Moynihan said, everyone is entitled to his own opinion. I think therapeutic touch works. I think it doesn't. It's irrelevant. You're not entitled to your own facts. Uh, and the facts show that there's nothing to that. Or as Philip K. Dick famously said, reality is that which, when you stop believing in it, doesn't go away. So this is the, the key to science and skepticism. We want to uh, find the, the things that don't go away when we stop believing in them. One of my favorite essays on, on this whole idea of, of gradually getting closer to the truth uh, was from Isaac Asimov's essay, The Relativity of Wrong. When people thought the earth was flat, they were wrong. When people thought the earth was, a, was spherical, they were wrong. The earth is not a perfect sphere. It's an oblate spheroid, fatter around the equators than, than pole to pole and so forth. But if you think that thinking the earth is spherical is just as wrong as thinking the earth is flat, then your view is wronger than both of them put together. <laughs> there is progress in science. Uh, as Dawkins says, when two opposite points of view are expressed with equal intensity, the truth does not necessarily lie exactly halfway between them. It is possible for one side to be simply wrong. So if you have a geologist that says the Earth is 4.6 billion years old, and you have a young Earth creationist that says the Earth is 10,000 years old, the truth is not halfway in between those. You don't add them up and divide by two or anything like that. Just one side is just wrong. We know which side it is in this case. As Sagan said, again, quoting this from a lecture that I used as the uh, part of the dedication to why people believe weird things, it seems, I, I was sitting there in the lecture when he, he said this, this is so great. It seems to me what is called for is an exquisite balance between two conflicting needs. The most skeptical scrutiny of all hypotheses that are served up to us, and at the same time, 
a great openness to new ideas. If you are only skeptical, then no new ideas make it through to you. You never learn anything new. You become a crotchety old person convinced that nonsense is ruling the world. And there is, of course, much data to support you. On the other hand, if you are open to the point of gullibility and have not an ounce of skeptical sense in you, then you cannot distinguish the useful ideas from the worthless ones. If all ideas have equal validity, then you're lost, because then it seems to me no ideas have any validity at all. Beautifully put. This is, his lecture was called The Burden of Skepticism. Never forget it. It's very moving. Another way to think of it is self, science is self-correcting, beautifully put by uh, the science writer Simon Singh. And uh, in, a, in a funny example he gives, he wrote this op-ed piece on Katie Malau's Bad Science. Okay, This is based on a song she wrote. She's a pop, pop singer in, in England, uh, expressing the, the affection she has uh, for her, uh, her partner that there are 9 million bicycles in Beijing. That's a fact. It's a thing we can't deny, like the fact that I will love you till I die. And then she expresses this musically. We are 12 billion light years from the edge. That's a guess. No one can ever say it's true. But I know that I will always be with you. So Simon writes an op-ed piece, Katie Malau's Bad Science in the Guardian. He wasn't being mean. He was just uh, having fun with this, but as, as a tool of explaining how science works, that in fact, we're not 12 billion light years from the edge. First of all, there is no edge to the expanding universe. The universe is not expanding into something. It is time, it's space time that's expanding. And it's not 12 billion years, it's 13.7 billion years at the time. It's actually now 13.8, rounded up a little bit <laughs> uh, from new observations. Uh, and, as he, and as he says, it's not a guess. Uh, I mean, astronomers have been working day and especially night, as he says, uh, to measure the age of the universe. And, uh, and they make predictions on this. Those predictions have error bar measurements uh, in which they say it's between this and this figure and so on. And from that, we uh, make a prediction that future observations should observe something within that error bar range and, and so forth. Much to his uh, surprise, he got a call from, uh, made contact with by, by Katie Malau herself, who said she was, felt kind of bad that she had been in the astronomy club and, and, and loved the science and, and was sorry she didn't get it right. So she went back and cut a new version, scientifically correct version. Here, here is the original and then the, the corrected version again. We are 12 billion light years from the edge. No one can ever say it's true, but I know that I will always be with you. And then uh, the scientifically correct version. We are 13.7 billion light years from the edge of the observable universe. That's a good estimate with well-defined error bars and with the available information. I predict that I will always be with you. See, even love has evidence. And you know what you call love without evidence? Stalking. <laughs> that's a Tim Minchin joke. Even love has evidence, that's right. So science requires that we test a claim to see if it's true. And you take something like the gopher golf ball finder, uh, which looks something like this. Now let me grab my own personal version of that. So here is the golf ball finder. <laughs> it looks something like this. And uh, this was actually brought to me by a dentist in the valley, uh, San Fernando Valley here in Southern California. Uh, and he, uh, we were putting it to the test for a uh, Dateline NBC uh, show uh, testing the golf ball finder, which for a reason I'll tell you in a moment. Uh, that is to say, this guy said uh, he could find golf balls at his golf course. And, well, I mean, I asked him, where are you finding them? He says, my golf course. Okay. <laughs> no surprise there, but how does it work? So he says he would just walk around and it would swing left and swing right. And when it would stop, he would then like go down. I'll back up a little bit here so you can see that. He, he, he would just sort of walk a pathway matching um, the, uh, you know, where it was pointing and, and then see where it went like that to that. And, uh, and then if you walk long enough and search 
far enough, you would eventually find a golf ball. So what we want to know is, could he find the golf ball without knowing where it's located? That is to say, if we blinded it. So here's a little test. You take a golf ball, you take two opaque cups, and you put it under one of them, far apart like that, two separate tables, something like this. So I do this as a demo in class. And, uh, and amazingly enough, the golf ball finder can do no better than random chance at finding golf balls. <laughs> now, interestingly, uh, by the time this was brought to us, it had been purchased by another company, the Quadro Corporation. And uh, it claimed that, so, so the way it supposedly works is there's inside this little chip here is a piece of golf ball. So it's like sympathetic magic. The energy from the golf ball goes out and like seeks like in a sympathetic magic way. And that directs the antenna. Okay, so if you put another chip on there that has some marijuana in it, then it'll find marijuana in students' lockers. So now instead of whatever this was, fifty nine ninety five or something for uh, golfers, they were selling this for nine hundred and I think ninety dollars to high school administrators to find pot in students' lockers. You can't just randomly open students' lockers. You gotta have probable cause. So the probable cause was this, that is the evidence shows that they must have. Well, you can imagine them walking down the hallway and it going left, right, left, right, and they just open enough lockers until they find, guess what? Somebody has marijuana in their locker, boom, it works. No, no, it doesn't work <laughs> under blind conditions, of course. So in science, we need not just the hits, we need the misses, that is the ratio of hits to misses, and ask is they, is that statistically significantly different from randomness, just like what Emily was trying to do there. So, um, and, and in fact, we debunked it and showed that it didn't work. Okay, now, one moment here. Now, to my utter astonishment, the golf ball finder reemerged years later when it was being uh, promoted as a bomb detecting device. That is to say, they upgraded the little plastic and the, and the antenna and the chip and made it seem much more sciencey, perfect example of pseudoscience. But instead of selling it for $59.95 to find golf balls or $950 to find marijuana, they were selling it for tens of thousands of dollars to detect bombs. That guy, James McCormick, is now in prison for what he did. Here's the video describing that. Now, James McCormick claimed his bomb detectors could trace explosives hidden underground, underwater, and even through walls. The businessmen sold them to governments, to armies, to border agencies, all the while knowing they didn't work. But his kit so convinced all of his buyers that he made tens of millions of pounds and in the process put the lives of hundreds of civilians and soldiers at risk. Well, today he was convicted of fraud, as our Home Affairs correspondent Andy Davies reports. Is there all people there, certainly when you're dealing with drugs, who don't want this equipment to succeed? Here is Jim McCormick in full flow on a sales trip to India. A man who, with his genial style and easy patter, clearly enjoys holding court. This equipment and the dog were perfectly hand in hand. Today at the Old Bailey, however, the spell was well and truly broken as the 57-year-old former policeman saw his hugely lucrative life on the road playing the role of global protector exposed for the gobsmacking scam that it was. His promos had all the contrived drama of a B-movie trailer. His security products, it turns out, all the credibility of the stunts used to sell them. This was the man who brought the world devices such as the ADE-651. No batteries, no electricity, in reality, no use whatsoever. And yet, all over the world, there were generals, police chiefs, even UN officials lining up to buy them. James McCormack is a conman. He's been maintaining this front for over 10 years now and fooling many, many people into believing this device could save lives. It couldn't and it doesn't. For how many years have you been in market? I've been making this unit. The initial unit was made in 1997. Originally from Liverpool, McCormick served briefly with Merseyside Police. He then began selling radio equipment. The offences relate to a five-year period beginning in 2007. Very different-looking version than what you right here. And then each... Of all McCormick's useless products, this was the most advanced. Neatly packed in a sturdy case, plastic cards would be placed in a pouch cabled to the detector. 
capable through nuclear quadrupole resonance, he boasted, of tracing EBP, explosive black powder, GEU, euros, NCC, cocaine, humans, ivory, all detectable by this, even from aircraft three miles away. And what was all this technology based upon a novelty golf ball finder called the Gopher? This is the product, would you believe, which underpinned Jim McCormick's multi-million pound security empire. A bit of plastic with a retractable aerial on a spindle. For the golfer, it adds whimsically, who has everything. For his first detection device, the AD100, McCormick just bought the Gopher and swapped the sticker. Here he is, out in the field, in his element, this time Niger. <laughs> and here is a soldier hunting for explosives with a modified version of the gopher. As detection devices completely ineffectual, said experts called by the prosecution. One would describe McCormick's following attempts to explain the technology as just an incomprehensible jumble of disconnected sentences. It's a pure passive receiver. So that simple process board is operating in frequencies below SSB, below HF. And yet he sold these devices all over the world. To the police in Belgium, to UN peacekeepers in Lebanon, until they wised up, to security forces in China, Japan, Kenya, Libya and Mexico, among many others, and to Iraq, his most profitable market. <laughs> In this most volatile of security environments, it's thought he sold 6,000 units, where hapless security personnel almost comically pounded their feet up and down, conned into thinking their own electrostatic energy was powering the units. But month after month, the carnage continued. There are no working parts in that device. It is empty. McCormick, for 10 years has sold this device in countries that are racked with terrorism. He has paid no heed to the people who stood on checkpoints believing this device worked. Again, you can see a number of the devices. He sold his devices for up to £35,000 each, it's thought. Total estimated sales, £85 million. Due to be sentenced next week, unrepentant to the end. So you still dispute the scientific evidence? Absolutely. A jury, it seems, Absolutely. detected the smell of something in what McCormick had to say, but it had little to do with explosives. Andy Davis reporting. Well, now let's go back to the Boston... Oh, boy. That is just wacky. So, yeah, here it is. That's it. The bomb detector, the golf ball finder. Nuclear quadrupole resonance. Okay, this we this is a, the technical word for this is bullshit. Okay, this is what we mean by pseudoscience, right? Uh, what are we doing? Well, I'm going to end this lecture by quoting from Stephen Jay Gould's forward to my book, which I thought was very moving. Um, Steve is a good friend and also a, a, a really strong supporter of the whole skeptical movement, uh, and and he captured better than I could. He's such a great writer. Uh, what it is we're doing when we're doing skepticism here. The need, both intellectual and moral, for skepticism arises from Pascal's famous metaphorical observation that humans are thinking reeds, that is both gloriously unique and uniquely vulnerable. Consciousness vouchsafed only to our species in the history of life on earth is the most god-awfully potent evolutionary invention ever developed. Although accidental and unpredictable, it has given Homo sapiens unprecedented power, both over the history of our own species and the life of the entire contemporary biosphere. Only two possible escapes can save us from the organized mayhem of our dark potentialities. The side that has given us crusades, witch hunts, enslavements, and holocausts. Moral decency provides one necessary ingredient, but not nearly enough. The second foundation must come from the rational side of our mentality. For unless we rigorously use human reason, both to discover and acknowledge nature's factuality and to follow the logical implications for efficacious human action that such knowledge entails, 
we will lose out to the frightening forces of irrationality, romanticism, uncompromising true belief, and the apparent resulting inevitability of mob action. Reason is our potential salvation from the vicious and precipitous mass action that rule by emotionalism always seems to entail. Skepticism is the agent of reason against organized irrationalism and is therefore one of the keys to human social and civic decency. Well put, Mr. Gould. R.I.P. You'll always be my hero. All right. Thanks for listening, and uh, we'll see you at the next lecture.